You get that winning spirit back here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And congratulations to the Panthers. Mike, by the way, I've purchased two cars in the last three months, one new, one used, so I'm trying to help out. I want to thank all of you for coming on Friday the 13th, the Friday before the 100th anniversary of the Titanic sinking, uh, and the Friday before tax day. Uh, those last two are very relevant to my remarks today because basically what I want to do is I want to start off to help you understand the true financial condition of the United States, where we've been, where we are, where we're headed, and what do we need to do to avoid a U.S. debt crisis. And understand, there's nobody to bail out America. We have to solve this problem. And bad news flows downhill. When the federal government restructures, less support to the states, therefore it's going to have a ripple effect all the way down. And frankly, not only does the federal government have problems, state and local governments have problems, and so all need to be restructuring now. Uh, they need to be doing what Mike did at AutoNation, look ahead, recognize the reality. We are on an imprudent and unsustainable path. Uh, we must act, uh, and we sh uh, prudently should act before a crisis forces us to act. Let me start first with a provocative statement. The United States is a great country, arguably the greatest in the history of mankind, but we're not as great as we think we are. We don't learn from history, and we don't learn from others, and that's a fundamental flaw. Let me also note that the United States has been in business since 1789, and it still has no strategic plan, no budget, and no performance metrics. Three basic Management 101 principles that you need to maximize performance and mitigate risk no matter what you do in life, public sector, private sector, not-for-profit sector. This is the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. I bolded and underlined certain words because they mean different things. Provide is different than promote. We have strayed from the, we have strayed from the provisions of the Constitution. This is the last amendment in the Bill of Rights, which basically reminds us that the federal government is only supposed to do things that otherwise the state can't do, and the fact is, is that res rights are reserved primarily to the people. Well, you wouldn't know that based upon the division of responsibilities between federal, state, and local government today. These are a few of the timeless principles and values that our country was founded on that relate to fiscal issues, meaning tax and spending uh, and budget-related matters. Limited but effective government individual liberty and opportunity, personal responsibility and accountability, rule of law and equal justice under the law, and fiscal responsibility and intergenerational equity. I would respectfully suggest we are violating all of these timeless principles to differing degrees today. I would also say that we're not discharging our responsibilities in connection with a key word. It's called stewardship. Stewardship means that as a leader in the private sector, public sector, and not-for-profit sector, your job is not just to generate positive results today. It's not just to leave things better off when you leave than when you came, but better positioned for the future. Whether it's our nation's finances, whether it's our nation's critical infrastructure, whether it's our nation's education system, whether it's our nation's environment, we are not discharging our stewardship responsibilities, and therefore our future is at risk. We face serious sustainability challenges that our political system, at least at the federal level, is not taking seriously. In 1800, the federal government was 2 percent of the U.S. economy. The world was a different place, and our place in the world was different. But frankly, uh, it was only about 3 to 4 percent of the economy in 1900. It has exploded since 1900 to where last year it was 24 percent of the U.S. economy, but more importantly, where are we headed? 37 percent on autopilot, absent a change in course. If you add state and local government, government would be over 50 percent of the U.S. economy in 2040. Now, I'm not an anti-government person. You know, I've, 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 some of the best, brightest, most capable and dedicated people I've ever worked with are public servants. But I do know this, having spent most of my career in the private sector, the government is not the engine of growth innovation, and job creation. And we cannot allow this to happen. 
the, the nature of the U.S. Thank you. The nature of the U.S. budget has changed profoundly. Forty years ago, the U.S. budget was dominated by defense, 42 percent. Uh, now it's down to 19.4 percent. Forty years ago, Congress got to decide how about two-thirds of the budget was allocated every year. Now it's down to 38 percent and declining. Guess what? All of the express and enumerated responsibilities for the federal government under the Constitution are in discretionary spending. That 38 percent that is declining, that's what's in the Constitution. It doesn't mean that those other areas aren't important. It just shows that not only have we grown big, but what we're doing is a lot different. By the way, the part that's shrinking represents all investments in our future and young people. The part that's growing represents conspicuous consumption and more for seniors. This is not a path for prosperity. This represents spending and revenues adjusted for inflation since World War II. If it's blue down below, the solid is spending, the dotted is revenues. If it's blue down below, it means the Democrats control the House and the Senate. If it's red, it means the Republicans. And if it's mixed, you can tell it was split. And if you've got really good eyes, you can tell who controlled the White House. Here's the bottom line. Spending is a bipartisan problem. It has been out of control in the last 11 years. There's not a party of fiscal responsibility. There are people who are, there's just not enough of them. And the last 11 years have been the most fiscally irresponsible in the history of the United States. Since from George Washington to William Jefferson Clinton, the country accumulated $5.6 trillion in debt. And since 2000, we have almost tripled our nation's debt. And we could double it again in the next 10 years unless we change course. And this is debt as a percentage of the economy, which I would respectfully suggest is what you need to focus on. Not all debt is bad. And a reasonable level of debt is OK and sustainable. Most economists will tell you debt equal to 60 percent of GDP is reasonable and sustainable. My view is, is that you not only have to consider public debt, but also the debt that we owe to Social Security and Medicare, so-called trust fund debt. Understand that when you say trust funds for the federal government, it doesn't mean the same thing as the private sector. The federal trust funds, you can't trust them. They're not funded. <laughs> Believe it or not, the federal trust funds are funded with debt. But in any event, so my point is there's only one time in the history of the United States that the U.S. has had over 60 percent of debt to GDP, and that was World War II. Well, we got something for World War II. We didn't have it for, to win our independence. We didn't have it for the War of 1812. We didn't have it for the Civil War. We didn't have it for World War I. We didn't have it for the Great Depression. Only World War II. Now we're back there again. And in fact, when you end up counting what we owe Social Security and Medicare, we're over 100 percent of GDP and adding debt at record rates. And here's the problem. This is where the iceberg comes in, the Titanic. The Titanic was sunk by an iceberg. And as we all know, uh, the, what the ice that you see above the water is a small fraction of what's below the water. And the, the Titanic was sunk by the ice below the water. Our problem is not today's deficits, 1.3 trillion. Our problem is not today's debt, 15.6 trillion. Our problem are the off-balance sheet obligations at the federal, state, and local level that are multiple times greater than what you see on the balance sheet. They represent the ice below the waterline that could literally sink the ship of state. Medicare, based on reasonable assumptions, underfunded $37 trillion. Social Security, $9 trillion. And a range of other commitments and contingencies that in the aggregate, $65 trillion, over $200,000 per American, over $550,000 per household. Median household income in America is $50,000. An implicit second or third mortgage equal to 11 times household income, but no house to back that mortgage. And at World War II, we had no foreign debt. Americans saved. Americans invested in the future of the country and their families. Uh, and, and it was all held in war bonds and other types of debt. Today, of the public debt, almost half is held by foreign lenders. 
And who is the largest investor in U.S. debt? Most people say China. No, the Federal Reserve. We are self-dealing in our own debt in order to be able to try to stimulate the economy, to hold down mortgage rates, to hold down interest rates. You can do that for a period of time. It is imprudent and unsustainable over time. We have the lowest interest rates in modern history, the, the lowest average maturity of duration for any major sovereign nation. We have huge interest rate risk. For every 1 percent increase in interest rates, 100 basis points, 150 billion bucks in interest. And what do you get for interest? As we say in the South, Shinola, nothing. In fact, if there was a line item in the federal budget that I would argue is waste, it's interest. And under the President's, because it's paying for past excess consumption. And when you look at the President's budget, and, you know, or CBOs, doesn't make any difference, it's projected that in 10 years we're going to be spending $800 billion a year on interest, for which we get nothing. And that doesn't assume a significant increase in interest rates. And believe me, it's not a matter if interest rates are going to go up. It's a matter of when they're going to go up and how fast. My nonprofit, the Comeback America Initiative, which focuses on federal, state, and local fiscal responsibility and sustainability, partnered with Stanford University on the West Coast, created the first ever ranking of countries for fiscal fitness. Uh, and we rank 34 countries, primarily OECD countries, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development based in Paris. Uh, Australia number one, New Zealand number two, Sweden number three, Greece number 34, the United States an embarrassing 28, down dramatically in the last uh, 11 years. We're not in a good neighborhood. We need to move on up. Good news, Australia, New Zealand, I'm sorry, Sweden's number four, Estonia just moved up, I apologize. Uh, most Americans don't even know where Estonia is, but that's okay. Uh, the, the, the fact is, is that some of the countries at the top had their own fiscal crises in the 90s, but they rose to the challenge. They met the challenge. If they can do it, we can do it. Believe me, there is a way forward. I'll come to that. Next, this is where our fiscal future is like. In, it, it, revenues at historical levels, if we don't reform Social Security and Medicare, and if we discharge the credit card. Fastest growing expense, interest. And what do you get for interest? Shinola. Shinola, you got it. Okay, <laughs> second fastest scoring expense, health care. And we spend double per person of any other major industrialized nation on health care, and we have below average societal outcomes. When you spend double per person and you get below average outcomes, the answer is not to throw more money at it. By the way, there's another system we spend double per person and we get below average outcomes, K through 12 education. We have to improve our incentives, transparency, and accountability. We have to fundamentally re-engineer those systems uh, or else they're not going to improve. And we spend as much as the next 15 nations combined on defense. And by the way, most of them are allies. We must cut defense spending uh, and constrain it without compromising national security. It is clearly possible. I was on the Defense Business Board for eight years. The Defense Department is a bloated bureaucracy. Most, many of the things that they're doing are based upon past threats rather than current future threats, uh, and uh, they have huge off-balance sheet, oh, well, they have huge uh, pension and retiree health obligations as well uh, that have to be dealt with. And we do have a progressive tax system. We can debate whether it's progressive enough, but the top 1 percent, you know, pay about 23 percent of all federal taxes. That's, fed that, that's income, payroll, and estate. Now, we can debate whether it's progressive or not, but here's the problem. Depending upon which year you talk about, anywhere from 35 to 50 percent of Americans pay Zippo in income tax. Now, they pay payroll taxes, but not income taxes. 35 to 50 percent get a free ride on the constitutional roles of the federal government. That is a dangerous disconnect in a democracy. If you ever get a majority of people who vote, who don't pay taxes, I'm moving. Because, let me tell you, I mean, then it's totally out of control. So on one hand, we've got too many people paying nothing. Now, obviously, those who have less should pay less. But you've got to have more people with skin in the game. The other problem you have on the other end, as, as Buffett talks about, you know, the very wealthy have, you know, don't have a very high marginal tax rate. People over a million have a, 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 a marginal tax rate of about uh, 19 percent. When the top the top marginal tax rate, or an effective tax rate, I apologize, of 19 percent, 
when the top effective tax rate is 35? How can that be? The answer is capital gains and dividends are taxed at 15 percent, and people of wealth typically make most of their money through capital gains and dividends. So my view is we need dramatic and fundamental tax reform that makes it simpler, fairer, more competitive, more equitable, that broadens the base, that lowers top marginal tax rates, and if we can get those down to 25 percent, we can eliminate the difference between capital gains and ordinary income, and we will solve a lot of problems, as well as making a number of other changes on the corporate side, which I'm happy to answer in Q&A. Four myths about our fiscal problem. You can't grow your way out. There's a new four-letter word. It's called math. <laughs> it would take double-digit real GDP growth for decades to grow your way out of a $65 trillion hole. It's never happened in the history of the United States. It's not going to happen. We need pro-growth policies, but we've got to have to make tough choices. You can't inflate your way out. Inflation lessens the burdens of the $15.6 trillion in debt, but that's not our problem. It's the 50-plus trillion in off-balance sheet obligations that grow faster than inflation and faster than the economy when the economy grows. In fact, by doing nothing, those numbers go up two to three trillion a year because they're discounted present value dollar numbers. And when you consider demographics and things of that nature, we can't tax our way out. We would have to double federal taxes. Or we can't cut our way out. You would have to decimate the social safety net, defense, and other key constitutional responsibilities. Everything's got to be on the table. Everybody's got to be at the table to solve this problem. We have to reimpose tough budget controls that existed from the early 90s to 2002. They expired 2002, and we've been out of control ever since, no matter who was in the White House, no matter who controlled Congress. They need to be tougher than what we had in the 90s, but we have to phase it in so we don't undercut the economic recovery and our efforts to try to be able to deal with unemployment and underemployment, which, by the way, are much worse than the government statistics because of the way that they keep the statistics. When you quit looking for a job, you don't not count it. And so therefore, when the economy really starts to improve, more people will start looking for the job. And ironically, you can actually see unemployment go up even when things get better. That's cause of how you keep score. We have to reform Social Security to make it solvent, sustainable, secure, more savings oriented. It's easy. It's a layup. And the reason we haven't done anything because we have no leadership. Secondly, thirdly, we have to reform Medicare, Medicaid, and our overall health care promises. We've way overpromised in health care, and the Affordable Care Act just complicated that problem and compounded it. The chief actuary of Medicare estimates that the Affordable Care Act will cost $12 trillion more than the politicians claim. Now, who are you going to believe, the professionals or the politicians? I can tell you who I believe. Defense and other spending, I've already talked about that. Comprehensive tax reforms, I've touched on that. From the corporate standpoint, we've got to eliminate a lot of deductions, exemptions, credits, and exclusions. There's a few that we ought to keep, just like we should on the, on the individual side. We need to reduce the top marginal tax rate to 25 percent. We need to go to territorial forms of taxation so that we're on the same level playing field as other major industrialized nations. We need to provide a deduction for dividends distributed for two reasons, not only to be able to eliminate double taxation of dividends, but to force boards of directors to invest the excess cash on the balance sheet for growth and jobs or distribute to try to get growth and jobs. Uh, and we're going to need some constitutional amendments for our finances, for our political system, and with regard to unfunded mandates. Because let me tell you, you think unfunded mandates are bad now? You wait till the stuff hits the fan. You think the federal government's going to end up taking their hands off and not try to legislate things and, and, and to tell you figure out how to pay for it? It's about time for a state-led constitutional convention. It's about time to pass the Madison Amendment, which would make it clear that states have the ability to call for a constitutional convention on one or a few uh, listed items and so we can avoid a runaway convention and so we can restore fiscal sanity, revitalize our democracy, and uh, restore states' rights, which have been significantly diluted uh, since 1913 when senators became directly elected by the people rather than appointed by the legislatures, and therefore they had their own constituency uh, and didn't have to worry. I'm not saying go back to that. I'm just saying we need changes. These are the six tests for feasibility of any plan. Is it pro-growth? Do we maintain a solvent, sustainable, secure social safety net? Uh, is it culturally acceptable with regard to the size and of government and the level of taxation? Do the numbers work? 
If you're trying to balance the budget or stabilize debt to GDP, do the numbers work based upon reasonable and straight-faced assumptions? Meaning you can keep a straight face when you talk about it in public. Are they politically feasible? Can you pass the House? Can you get 60 votes in the Senate? And can you get a presidential signature? And last but not least, can you get meaningful bipartisan support? If you can't, uh, it's not sustainable. The Affordable Care Act, party line vote. Uh, the Ryan budget, party line vote. Uh, they fail other tests too. Uh, you can't govern that way. Last two slides, I believe. Ross Perot ran for president.